I made the freshman team and I was batting like 800. So one time uh, we finished practicing, the freshman team finished practicing and uh, we decided to go to the varsity game. So we uh, changed, we went up to the varsity game, was standing behind the bench and the game wasn't going that well. So Fredericks turned around to all of us and he said, Bracken, go get your uniform right now. I said, what do you mean, go get my uniform? Go get your uniform. Now from the bench to the locker room, it's about a 10 minute run. So I ran as fast as I can, I'm shaking. I said, you gotta be kidding me. I'm a freshman, I'm gonna play varsity for a team that just won the state championship and I'm gonna play. So I ran back, I got my uniform, I'm in this freshman uniform that's just the worst uniform ever. I, I ran back, I'm standing next to the bench, the varsity has these beautiful brand new uniforms. I'm standing there, I have no idea what to do. I'm shaking. All of a sudden, we're up and we have our best player coming up to bat. He goes, Bracken, pinch hit for him. And I go, Don, what do you, I mean, I didn't say Don, I say, coach, what are you doing? He said, get up there. And I'm shaking and, um, and I don't know what these other players are thinking now. I'm a freshman coming up and I'm going to be batting for the best player. But he wanted to prove a point. He wanted to say, he doesn't care if you're the best player on the team or not the best player. He was going to play the players that he wanted. He was proving a point right here. So I went up to bat. I don't think I ever swung the bat. And, but I walked, and uh, it was amazing because I was shaking so much. Brian Madden, who really couldn't hit, hits a ball out of the park of the Babe Ruth field. And I remember he's like going around the bases, kind of celebrating. And I remember in the middle of his, his tr uh, trot around the bases, Dad stopped the whole thing and said, Brian, you hit a home run, now go get the ball. And Brian always talks about how he's like his favorite moment ever. Never hit a home run before. He feels like a big leaguer. And here he's jotting around, trotting around the park. And he's, he had to totally stop. Couldn't even finish running to home. And he had to go outside the field, in the woods, in the poison ivy, in the thorns, and find the baseball. Or he had to run. And so Brian always talks about that anytime I see him. My senior year, I made a deal with Mr. Fredericks. Um, he had two fancy cars that um, I really liked. And I made a deal with him that if I hit a specific number of home runs by a specific date, which was for the senior prom, uh, it was a, yeah, the senior prom, that he would let me take one of his cars. So he was skeptical about it, but he reluctantly agreed to it. So. Mr. Fredericks had a really nice navy blue Trans Am with the big eagle on the front. That was his car, real sporty, whole thing. And his wife's car was a uh, Grand Prix. It was a magenta, I believe it was a white roof with white leather interior, bucket seats, the whole thing. So the deal was, the agreement was that if I hit 10 home runs by that particular date that he would let me take one of those cars. And I, I can guarantee you that he thought that I was gonna take his car. He's right, I thought he was gonna uh, select my Trans Am. It came to that particular final game and I actually hit two home runs to reach the number 10. He popped two home runs and as he crossed the plate and so forth and whatever, you know, I could see his head just looking right at me. When I told him that I wanted to take his wife's car, he not only was he a little shocked, but I don't think he asked Donna if that was okay prior to that. So I'm not sure his wife, so I'm not sure that she was all that through with me taking, taking the car. He chose to take Scott McKinney with him, who was a great hockey player for us, and they went and either McKinney or Buck, I'm assuming it was McKinney, threw up in the back seat of the car. Uh, I don't have any recollection of that, but I can tell you that we took good care of the car and returned it unharmed. You can't get smell out like that. And mom knew it and I knew it and we cleaned it and cleaned it and it took about three months to eventually get the smell out. Now, I was happy at that time that he chose my new uh, red uh, Grand Prix that I had bought my wife instead of my new Trans Am that I bought myself. And uh, because if he had thrown up my Trans Am, I would have been riding to school every day. We were at Morissette and we were playing under the lights in the Legion game and me and you got in a little argument and I threw my glove over the backstop. And you said to me, wow, I wish you could throw like that in a game. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. I was so mad at you that day. I'm really sorry it was my fault.
at one time we were doing a soccer game together at Zavarian High School, and I'll probably never forget this, but from way over the other side of the field, the coach of Zavarian, uh, assistant coach of Zavarian, was screaming at Dawn. And Dawn's reaction was to be Dawn, obviously. And he uh, slowly but surely walked himself over across the field in his typical self. And he looked at this assistant coach and he said, Junior, I don't talk to you. And, the, and poor Junior's jaw dropped, and I never laughed so hard in all my life. That was one incident. Um, I remember at the Milton basketball game, they had a kid named Tom Giotrakis, Greek uh, soccer player who played at BU, great player. He, his job was just to face, face guard me, and so I couldn't get the ball. And I was an athlete that played basketball. I was by no means a great basketball player. Um, but I tried to get open. They played box and one to keep the ball out of my hands, and he, he did his job. And I remember Dad's famous line in basketball always was, you know, you're, you're hiding, you're hiding. And he must have said, you're hiding 50 times during the game. And I was at the foul line. It was quiet. And I was on the line um, waiting there. And I hear it's now silent because someone's shooting a free throw. And he yells, you're hiding. And I remember I turned and yelled, shut up. And the whole gym went silent at Milton High School. And everyone just turned to look at him because no one has ever talked to our father that way. And they were all looking to see what his response was. And he, I, don't, I didn't look up there, but he didn't say anything else. And I remember people talked about that for days and months about you know, how dad was finally silenced. Um, and you'd have to ask him about what his response was that. But I had just had enough from hearing it all the time. And I think Kevin Buckley may have been pitching. He had about three batters left in him and it was only the seventh inning. So. Don would bring in the right field at a pitch, and then if there were two men on, he'd switch and bring Kevin Buckley back in for a face one batter, and this continued, and after a while, he ran out of trips to the mound, so he had to rely on Fred Thatcher to, from the, from the bench, signal to Kevin Buckley and the pitcher to switch positions, and of course, Kevin couldn't warm up, but he could go in and pitch, and I just always remember uh, that particular game, and I probably ha don't have it totally right. Nah, et cetera, and we got out of Millington, Tennessee, and had a sleepover in Michigan for five hours. Nothing like being in an airport five hours with 18 kids. Uh, I don't even want to go there when my catcher was hurt, at, and we were going to play the Holy Cross, and uh, Stearns was a backup catcher, and he was kind of nervous, and so we're taking infield. He, his first throw down to second base hits the pitching rubber, and I knew he was shaking in his boots. I said, no, that's not going to happen. So my catcher, who had partially separated his shoulder, was told he was going to catch that day. Wasn't going to swing a bat. Wasn't going to do anything except just catch and lob the ball back to the pitcher. And he did it. And Stearns, he, uh, we lost the game, but uh, Stearns, he didn't get to, to catch. I don't know if I got him into the game at the end, but uh, uh, that's the Stearns story, and it's still there. After the first pitch, Kevin Lahane on third base nods his head at me. And I didn't know what he meant. On the second pitch, he nods a little more. Now, all of a sudden, I realize he wants to steal home to tie the game up. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. No, I don't think so. Even I'm not that crazy. Now, the next pitch is uh, a ball, so it makes it 2-1. He's nodding again. So now I go, uh, the, uh, no, you know, I don't. Next pitch is 2-2. Two and two. So now I say to Kevin, go ahead, because Richie's going to strike out and he's going to end the game. That's my feeling. He's going to strike out and end the game. He's overmatched and whatever. So I just nod my head. Kevin takes off. The pitcher double winds up, double winds up, and he takes off. He's got home stolen. He's standing next to the batter. He's standing next to the batter. Richie squares the bunt and bunts it foul. Now, when you bunt foul on the third strike, you're out, Okay. Now, Richie obviously thought the squeeze play was on because Kevin was standing right next to him, right? So he bunts it foul, and he's out, and the game's over. No one knows what's happened. 